It's a uh, great pleasure to appear before the City Club. Join us, ask questions, and talk to the people who make New York what it is. A New York City tradition. Welcome. You're watching the City Club's Public Policy Forum. I'm Stan Altman, the chairman of the City Club of New York. The City Club of New York is a civic organization that for 108 years has served as a nonpartisan group overseeing the city government to ensure that it is efficient, effective, honest, and responsive to its citizens. The way we carry out our role is through various programs, one of which is the Public Policy Forum series that you're watching right now. One of the roles that the City Club has taken has been a concern that not only do we pay attention to the issues that are current in today, but that we concern ourselves about the quality of life in the city and the leadership that's available to it. And therefore, we take every opportunity to try to encourage our young, who are today's students, to become active leaders in our society. We do that in part by inviting students from our colleges and our public school system to join us to get an opportunity to meet people like the members of the club, our speakers, and get exposed to the issues that are current before us. So it's my pleasure today to invite and introduce to you a number of students from the City University system. First, I'd like to in introduce two students from Hostess Community College, Ms. Sandra Colon and Ms. Keneal Williams. <laughs> Second, I'd like to introduce two of the graduate students from Baruch College, the School of Public Affairs, Ms. Joelle Fontaine and Ms. Christine Gonzalez. And their advisor and is Ms. Marissa Panzani. One of the reasons that we are um, concerned as an organization about education is, as I've said, is the, is the view that we have a role to play and a responsibility about how we forge our leaders in our society. Therefore, the topic of education is one that is forever present, current, and at the forefront of what the City Club has pursued. In fact, the last two years, we've had a wide variety of forums that have addressed issues dealing with charter schools, dealing with the whole question of standards, dealing with remediation at the City University, dealing with the City University as an economic engine for the City of New York. Um, so it's my pleasure today to introduce our guest speaker, uh, Mr. Herman Badillo. What is interesting, as I mentioned to him before we started this program, is that 18 months ago he came before the City Club and basically put out the challenge of the importance of the City University focusing on the whole question of standards and the whole question of remediation and the responsibility of all of us to take a much harder look at what was happening in our public school systems, not only what was happening in our City University. That it was really impossible to decouple the two but that in the course of trying to address the larger issues of educating our students, not only for jobs and as the source of the manpower that fuels our economy, but really as having an informed citizenry that really make up the fiber of our city and its, and its public life, he raised the issue of how we were going to really rise to the occasion. Uh, in a more formal research sense, it may be difficult to kind of prove the causality between that speech and what has now transpired over the last 18 months. But certainly, um, if there is an issue that has moved to the fore in the city of New York, it's been the whole question of public education at all levels. Uh, and for the first time in my memory, in over 30 years of being concerned about what went on in both the public schools and at City University, the business community and other sectors have stepped up to the plate and said it's really time that everybody um, really take responsibility for what's happening. So it's with my great pleasure uh, and I, just uh, two other personal comments. I mean, Mr. Badillo has had a long history. He is currently the chair of the Board of Trustees of the City University of New York. He's been a congressman. He's been a deputy mayor. Uh, I know him as a, as a young youth growing up in the Bronx as the only official that I, if you'd ask me who was in government, would be my borough president, which was Herman Badillo. And on a very current personal note, the City Club of New York is broadcast on CUNY Cable. Uh, our broadcast on uh, Wednesdays is at 7.30 to 8. And if you leave the TV on for about two more minutes, you'll discover that we're the warm-up routine 
for his program and educational priorities. So uh, it seems like I'm forever introducing you one way or another, Herman. So it's my great pleasure to introduce Herman Badillo. Thank you very much. And I must say, I've been before the City Club many, many times over the years, but I have never been in such magnificent surroundings as you have here in the National Arts Club and such uh, magnificent food. The National Arts Club is a, one of the most elegant uh, buildings in the city of New York, and it has another distinction, and that is that it was in the National Arts Club where I met my wife. My wife, as you may know, is a seventh grade teacher. And uh, several years ago, she was having a Shakespeare exhibit here at the National Arts Club, and I was asked to uh, appear, and that's where we met. So as Alden James, the president of the National Arts Club, says, aside from everything else, Cupid is alive and well at the <laughs> National Arts Club. I welcome the opportunity to speak to you as chairman of the board of the City University because I have a very ambitious agenda and I need your support in order to be able to carry it out. My agenda is to ensure that we get more and more people who graduate with a meaningful degree from the city university because my view of the problems of this country is that the difficulties are not between black and white as much as they are between the educated and the uneducated. And we simply cannot afford to have so many more of our people failing to get a meaningful education and failing to get the opportunity to participate in the uh, life of the city in terms not just of business but in all other aspects of it. So I want to talk uh, directly about my agenda. First item was the selection of a strong chancellor who's committed to the city and to the university. And you may remember that there had been no chancellor at the city university for over two years. And when I became chairman in less than two months, uh, we selected Matthew Goldstein as the chancellor. I selected Matthew Goldstein because Matthew Goldstein <coughs> was born in New York City. He's a graduate of City College. It's interesting that we now have a a uh, chancellor and a chairman who were both graduates of City College, and Matthew Goldstein was president of Baruch College and did an outstanding job. And we all know that Matthew Goldstein is not going to disappear. He's not going to use uh, the uh, City University as an enhancement to his resume, but he is committed to the city, to the students, and to the university. And that's the only way that I think that uh, we can move ahead in this city. Stan mentioned I was president of the Bronx, and many years ago when commissioners would come and go, I would have commissioners coming to my office, and I would tell them, you see that street? That's the Grand Concourse. They would say, oh, that's the concourse? Because they came from out of town. I said, yes. When you understand what the Grand Concourse is in the life of the Bronx and the city, you'll know something about New York. And that's the problem. It takes people two years or more to figure out what's going on and we simply do not have the luxury of wasting all that time, and that's why I'm delighted to have Matt Goldstein. Second thing that uh, has been done is to publish what the agenda is in great detail. And as you know, I was appointed along with Ben O'Smith, who's the chairman uh, of the Mayor's Task Force, to prepare a report on the City <coughs> University. That report, the City University of New York, an institution adrift, is uh, available to all of you, and uh, I suggest that you look at it because it is a blueprint of what we need to do to improve the city university. And those items there are the items that we will be uh, moving to implement as we go along, Matt Goldstein and the Board of Trustees and I. So nobody should be in doubt about what our intentions are. It's spelled out very clearly. Now, we want to be, I want to begin to talk about the specific recommendations which are included in the report. This month, we are going to be voting on a very important recommendation. It was approved by the uh, Committee on Academic Affairs earlier in the month and is going, coming up before the Board of Trustees this Monday, September 27th. And that is, 
we are going to establish entrance tests for remedial education and exit tests for remedial education. And the reason we need to do this is because we find that at the city university, in the community colleges, over 87% of the students are not able to pass the tests that we give them in reading, writing, and arithmetic. And at the senior colleges, about 72% are unable to pass them. To give you an idea of what that means, nationwide, at the community colleges, it's only 40%, and at the senior colleges, it's only 22%. So we have a far greater degree, by far, enormous degree of remedial education required in New York City. And the reason for that is because there are no standards in elementary and secondary schools, what I talked about when I was here 18 months ago. You may remember that at that time, I spoke out against the practice of social promotion, which says that everybody passes just because you get to be a year older. And I pointed out that uh, my wife, who's a seventh grade teacher, uh, has had students who don't do the work because <clears throat> they're unprepared in the seventh grade, and then they're promoted, not from the seventh to the eighth grade, they're promoted to the ninth grade if they're 15 years old or older because there's a rule known as age appropriate. If you're 15 years old, even if you can't do anything, you go on to high school. Now that to me is outrageous and I have found no justification for it. Some years ago they said that justification was that it's sociologically bad for a child to be left behind. So I said, well, maybe it is, but show me the sociologist who wrote the book. You know what? No sociologist ever wrote such a book. So then I said, well, my sociologist, whom I'll produce when you produce yours, says that it's sociologically worse for a child to be 17 years old and not be able to read or write or do arithmetic. And therefore, I have consistently uh, been opposed to the practice of social promotion. And I'm happy to report that Chancellor Crew has now agreed that he will remove that practice, unfortunately, beginning of September of next year. That, I'm always suspicious about doing something in the future. That's why when I talk to you, I talk about what I'm doing now, because I've seen over the years that plans that have been made by people uh, uh, disappear when the individuals move away. And so, uh, but I want you to understand that at least I'm grateful that the Board of Education, six to one, voted to eliminate social promotion. I'd prefer that Chancellor Crew would stay, but at least the Board of Education has voted to eliminate it so that uh, uh, we can hope that the practice uh, will come to an end. But in the meantime, we're faced with graduates who are the victims of the practice of social promotion. So we are establishing nationwide recognized tests which will evaluate the performance of those graduates because really they don't have a real high school diploma. And that's the problem. I mean, the students we get at CUNY are not the students from Bronx Science or Stuyvesant who are top students. They're students from other high schools where there are no standards. So we want to know how much remedial education they need in order to bring them up to college level. But even more importantly, we want to be sure that they have finished their remedial education. So for the first time in 30 years, we are going to have an exit test for remediation because uh, it never occurred apparently to any chancellor or any college president or any professor in 30 years that if somebody needed remediation, it should be tested to find out if they completed remediation. And you may remember that at Astos Community College, before uh, Dolores Fernandez became the president, we found out two years ago that there were students who were about to graduate who could not pass a simple test in, uh, in English. And now that has been changed, now that Dolores Fernandez is the president of Astos College, and Astos has uh, begun to uh, improve. And you know that we had a situation at City College where we found that over 60% of the students who got a degree in education could not pass the teacher's exam in English. Now, it doesn't do any good to give someone a degree in a profession if they can't exercise that profession because they can't pass the exam. So 
there is a need to establish that uh, remediation has come to an end, and we hope to get that. It's now on the agenda of the Board of Trustees, and we hope to uh, approve it uh, this coming Monday. Next item on my agenda is a resolution that I've already passed. Uh, is a resolution to end remedial assistance at the senior colleges, and that will be over a period of time. The first four colleges are Baruch, which already has eliminated remediation, Queens College, Hunter, and Brooklyn. Then comes another set of, co of colleges. And this, the first group is um, January of the year 2000, next year. Second group is September of the year 2000. The last group, which is Medgar Evers and York, will be in September of the year 2001. And what we want to do is ensure that nobody is matriculated at a senior college unless they are ready for college work. And the reason for that is that what's been going on is that students are given remedial work, that is high school work, to get them ready for college. And at the same time, they're given college work for which they're not ready. Now that makes no sense because what happens is that the professor who is given remedial assistance tends to feel sorry for them and passes them. And if you don't believe that, you should read a book written by Jim Traub, City on a Hill, written several years ago about City College. Jim Traub sat in on a remedial class at City College. There were 26 students in the class and he found that at the end of the term, the professor said two, maybe three, deserve to be in college. But he said it at the end of the term, not at the beginning, and he passed everyone. In the meantime, those students were taking college credit. Now, the professor who's giving them college credit feels sorry for them because they're getting remedial work. So they tend to pass, and it goes on and on and on, and nothing happens because there's no verification that the students are ready for college work and that they have finished the remedial assistance. So we are saying, can matriculate until you finish remedial assistance. You can take summer courses, you can take continuing education courses, you can take any number of courses that you want, but you can't be matriculated in the senior college unless you have established that you are ready for college work. And this is a very important resolution, which is now pending before the Board of Regents, has been approved by us, and uh, uh, we, uh, we, we ask for your support because it's, uh, it, it's not final until the Board of Regents uh, approves it, and there is a very strong debate about that resolution. The next program that I'm working on is a program which we call College Now, because if we recognize that is not the fault of the students, and I want to make it clear that at no time um, have I ever at any forum blame the students for the problems. The students can learn like everybody else, but my concern is that they do learn. It's not the fault of the students that they did not have standards. In fact, I met some students at Borough Manhattan Community College who were very upset because they, found, they thought they had a real high school diploma, and then they found out that they didn't, and they were upset because they had to take a lot of courses to get ready for high school. So it's not their fault, but in the meantime, it's a reality that they are not being prepared in high school. So we developed a program at Kingsboro Community College, which I want to expand, called College Now, where the professors at CUNY work with the students in the high schools and test them in the 11th and 12th grade to make sure that when they graduate, they will not need remedial assistance. That program has worked in the 60 or so high schools that we have uh, used it. What I want to do is to expand it to every single high school in the city, and not just in the 11th or 12th grade, but in the 9th grade, to test the students in the 9th grade so we can work with them in the 9th, 10th, 11th, and 12th grade to reduce the uh, amount of remedial work that will be required. And in this program, we plan to meet Chancellor Goldstein and I with uh, uh, the President of the Board of Education, William Thompson, and with Chancellor Crew to begin to implement this program, but we uh, certainly would appreciate your support because uh, it works, and it can work even more in every single uh, high school uh, throughout the city. Uh, this is a, uh, a key thing because it doesn't cost much money. The whole thing 
we estimate will be about 10 to 15 million dollars, but we will save far more than that because we'll be getting students uh, who, are, who are ready for college work. Now, the other thing that I have in mind, and this one I need your support with the legislature on, is if we recognize that it's not the fault of the students that they need remediation, remedial assistance, because they don't have a real high school diploma and they need to get high school courses, then they shouldn't have to pay for those courses. What's going on now is that we have a tuition assistance plan, as you know, which covers uh, half of the students who come to the city university. But the tuition assistance plan is limited in the number of semesters which assistance is provided. And when students come in and they need remedial assistance, that's charged to the tuition assistance plan. When they're ready for college work, they find that they've used up a large percentage of their tuition assistance and they have to drop out. That is, makes no sense whatsoever because the whole purpose of giving them remedial assistance is make sure they graduate. So if we cut off financial assistance, we are preventing them from graduating. Therefore, it seems logical that they should not have to pay for this tuition out of the college assistance. I mean, you know, I've, I've always been in favor of free tuition anyway, and I'm not suggesting that it's possible to do this, but you know, those of you who go back in the city club with me for many years, you know that the reason we have tuition at the city university is because when we had the fiscal crisis in New York City in the 70s, Congress insisted, I was a member of Congress then, that there were two conditions that they would, um, we would have to comply with in order to provide assistance to the city. One was an increase in the subway fare, and the other one was tuition at the city university, because nationwide, the congressmen resented the fact that we were the only university that had free tuition. So we were forced to agree. But we don't have to impose payment of tuition for remedial assistance, which is not the fault of the students. And therefore, you all have very good contacts, I know, with uh, assemblymen and state senators and uh, with members of the city council. So I would urge you, even if you disagree with me on everything else, to uh, please get in touch with them and uh, see to it that uh, we can get support to eliminate um, the cost of remediation to the students, both in the community colleges, which is a New York City problem, and at the senior colleges, which is the uh, problem of the, uh, of the state. Now, um, the next thing we would like to do is to, uh, by the way, expand the tuition assistance program because it's very limited. If you miss out in one or two terms, you're in trouble. I mean, I'd like to have a little more leeway so that students who need to take more semesters in order to graduate will be able to do so in order to cut down the, uh, cut down the uh, dropout rate. The next plan that we have in mind is to begin to establish flagship colleges at the city university. Because if you get that report and you look on page 23, you will see that there's a chart that indicates that even at the best schools, Baruch and Hunter and, and, and Brooklyn and Queens, the uh, SAT levels are below the 50th percentile in all of our colleges. Now, when every other large institution, SUNY, for example, the University of California, they have colleges which are first or second tier colleges. We don't have them. And what happens is we lose a good percentage of the best students in New York City, students such as those from Bronx Science, Stuyvesant, Townsend Harris, and other schools. And so we need to bring them up to the first tier, and that will be uh, one of the uh, assignments that uh, Matthew Goldstein will be working on in order that uh, the reputation of the uh, city university uh, can, be, uh, can be restored. Now, the, uh, the last thing that we need to do, if you look at the report, is to increase the budget of the city university. Because if you look at the report, you will see that there has been a great deal of cutbacks and an increase in tuition over the years at the city university. Now this increase is not a partisan political thing. I was appointed originally by Governor Mario Cuomo, a Democrat, 
and I was appointed chairman of the board by <coughs> Governor Pataki, a Republican, and I've worked with David Dinkins, and I worked with Mayor Giuliani, and the state legislature and the council. They all voted for tuition increases in the past 10 years. And I've argued with, the, with Governor Cuomo and uh, with David and the legislature and the council that we should not have tuition increases, but they keep coming. We need to have additional funds from the city and the state, which are not tuition increases because, as the report points out, we have a large number of adjunct professors. We want to have full-time tenured professors, and we need to uh, have more funds in order to deal with the problems. Now, the difficulty is that many, many years ago, when, uh, for example, Wagner was the mayor of New York City, the attitude about the city university was that it should be put to one side whenever fiscal problems arose because the mayor felt that the city university was not a regular city agency, that city university was an investment in the future of the city. Therefore, if you had to cut the budget, you cut it in other agencies, but uh, you didn't cut out the, uh, you didn't cut the city university. By the way, I am the only commissioner in the history of New York City whose budget was exactly zero under Wagner because I was appointed by Wagner. You may remember when I came here as commissioner of housing and he told me what he told all the commissioners. You can do anything you want to as long as it doesn't cost the city of New York any money. Now that made all the commissioners <laughs> depressed, but I walked out cheering, I said, thank you, Mr. Mayor. So I got in all kinds of programs, programs for youth, programs for the elderly, programs in drug addiction. We had tremendous programs. West Side Urban Renewal Project is one of those, Bronx Park South, Bellevue South, Cadman Plaza. And I would have the mayor go to press conference where he'd announce the program. He said, is this costing us any money? I said, no, don't worry about it. And the reporters would call me and said, did the mayor wipe out your agency? No. He says, well, how did you get the budget to be zero? I said, the mayor forgot that I'm a certified public accountant as well. So I worked it out. I, was, I had the urban renewal projects were paid for two-thirds by the federal government, one-sixth by the state, and one-sixth by the city. So then I only had to worry about one-sixth. The one-sixth of the city I charged to the capital budget. So the operating budget had no money. See? Now, um, not every commissioner could do that, but uh, I did it, and that's how I got by in my, with innovative ideas in my department. But the point is that <coughs> the theory now is that if we have a budget crisis, and we always have a budget crisis, and you have to cut the budget by 5 or 10%, you cut the budget 5, 10% for CUNY. And I said, no, you know, fellows, we're not that kind of institution. So we got to get that mindset away from the executive and legislative branches that we are supposed to be a, an investment in the future and we should not have tuition increases and we should not have budget cuts because if we do that, then we will be able to plan because the problem with planning is you find that the budget is cut or that tuition is increased and therefore you can't, you can't move on. So that gives you an idea of what I'm trying to do as chairman of the board and the reason why I need your support. And I'm doing this, and I, by the way, I don't get paid for any of this, which is uh, another issue. But uh, <laughs> as you may know, I have been spending the last few years focusing primarily in the area of education, um, not only as a trustee at CUNY, but also working with the mayor. You remember I prepared an analysis of the budget of the city of New York in 1994, which led to Cortinas's resignation because it showed that uh, their monies were not being appropriately spent. But the reason I'm doing that is because I resigned from Congress because I came to the conclusion as one of the most liberal members of Congress I often point out I was also one of the boldest because I sat in Congress, though I didn't have to, between Bell Avsuk and Shirley Chisholm. And, <laughs> and, and everybody in Washington was afraid of them. Uh, and I was the only one who could tease them and, and, and get away with it. Um, but I came, we all came, most of us in the New York delegation, 
came to the conclusion that Congress was never going to pass a bill for full employment, although I was a sponsor of the Humphrey Hawkins bill, which some of you may remember, that Congress was never going to pass a bill for housing for all, that Congress was never going to pass a bill for health care for all, and we saw this recently in the fiasco that Hillary uh, is responsible for a few years ago. But the one thing I concluded, and is clear now, is that the one area where it's recognized that government has a legitimate function is in education. We all recognize that government has to fund education. And if you get a good education, then you can get your own job and get your own housing, get your own health care, and take care of your family. So the answer to poverty is not having additional resources from government. The answer to poverty is ensuring that everyone can get a good education. And that's why it's so tragic that so many of our young people fail to get a good education. It is possible to get a good education. And if we do that, we will solve the most important domestic problem in America, which is the problem of the gap between the rich and the poor, which really is the gap between the uneducated and the educated. That's not an impossible thing to do, and we can do it if we all work together. Thank you very much. You're watching the City Club of New York's Public Policy Forum. Our guest speaker today is Mr. Herman Bedillo, Chairman of the Board of Trustees of the City University of New York. At this part of the program, we invite guests to come up and uh, ask questions. Uh, Mr. Bedillo, let me ask you a question to get started. Uh, this is the report you refer to, uh, the City University of New York, an institution adrift. Uh, one of the things of, about this report, when one reads it, is one is struck that its major focus is really about the undergraduate programs within the City University. And I was delighted to hear you make reference to the important role that the City University plays in terms of the economic uh, viability of the city. Can you make some comments about the rest of it? Because a lot of people have come away with the impression that this is all about the, all programs in the City University. And I gather that from your perspective, this doesn't really accurately portray the graduate programs. No, because uh, actually we go more even into the elementary and secondary school system because we say that's where the problem arises. But as I think you all know, we have some very important graduate programs at the City University, and the graduate school has just moved to another beautiful building, the B. Altman building, right. and uh, the <coughs> facilities there will be improved, and the resources will be improved, so we expect that those programs will be enhanced as well. Great, thank you. First question there. I'm Mark Crawford Levitt. I'm, uh, I, the logic of everything you say is irrefutable, and I certainly support it and hope we all will. About eight or nine years ago, the City Club uh, the City Club's Housing and Education Committees jointly passed uh, an idea, which some of us may remember, which would link the opportunity for home ownership with education, whereby people would get some kind of credits on account of the down payment of a house, which would be like a zero interest mortgage from government, by virtue of completing, satisfactorily completing educational courses. This would apply to people of moderate income level or less. I wonder if an idea such as this that would have this extra incentive of helping families to buy a home, which is part of the problem, uh, is something that maybe in New York City, which has always been the leader of everything in the, in the country, could, could start. And it's, you know, it's a concept that it, it doesn't cost any money until it works because people will have completed the education to be able to justify a bank loan and then the supplements would help. Listen, as you know, I'm in favor of anything that helps people uh, own housing. And as you um, may probably know, I was the one who rebuilt Charlotte Street. Remember many years ago when I was in Congress, I had Jimmy Carter come to my district where Charlotte Street was. And uh, my theory was that if the President of the United States came to Charlotte Street and the picture was taken with the burnout buildings in the background, he would be forced to do something about it. I then... Um, met with him in the Oval Room in the White House, went over a whole program for rebuilding the South Bronx. I thought he understood it because he was an engineer. And I resigned from Congress to become deputy mayor in charge of rebuilding the South Bronx. And I, re I, I got the plan approved. Even my enemies, like Ramon Velez and others, voted for it because it made sense. Um, and then 
uh, Jimmy Koch came in and said, the president is angry with you. I said, why? Because you got the plan approved. And I said, that was the idea. He says, well, the president is worried that if you rebuild the South Bronx, you're going to have to rebuild every slum in America. I said, of course, that was the process. Why would I resign from Congress unless that was the idea? So the president insisted on getting it voted down, and the plan was uh, voted down. And now the same pres ex-president now, going around with a hammer and nail, trying to rebuild apartment by apartment. There's no need to do that. Let me tell you, the easiest thing in the world, I'll tell you what I told Jimmy Carter, because I really am a housing commissioner, and that's how I started. The easiest thing we can do is to eliminate the slums in this country. Why? It doesn't cost billions, because what happened was that the housing burned down. The infrastructure is there. We have the streets, we have the sewers, we have the lights, we have the parks, we have the police stations, the fire station, transportation facilities. If you bring back the housing at a lower density, you have an instant neighborhood, and it doesn't cost very much. For example, I brought in at Logue, we rebuilt Charlotte Street, one family homes owned by poor people, uh, blacks and Hispanics, safest neighborhood in the city because it's their home. Now, it doesn't cost very much. Why? Because in any housing structure, there are only five factors. The cost of land, which is nothing because the city owned the land. The, uh, the cost of taxes, which is nothing because the city wasn't collecting taxes anyway. The cost of money, which is interest. And there, I had been appointed by Mario Cuomo, chairman of Sunny May, and we gave them low interest loans. So we brought down that cost. See, the, uh, the cost of maintenance, which is nothing because the people own the housing, and therefore they can uh, maintain their own houses, and the cost of construction, which is the only real cost, but there we brought in um, pretty much rebuilt houses from uh, uh, manufactured in Pennsylvania. Therefore, if you go back and see, because after I left, Koch agreed with me, he provided over $5 billion for the South Bronx. We have almost finished rebuilding the South Bronx, and it's owned by people, because when people own their own housing, they don't, uh, they don't harm it, nothing gets burned down. So really, uh, my view is that, the, that we should be able to do this, and it's a very small investment. I do okay. remember, I worked yeah. with Bill Hubbard in the South Bronx okay. then, and I'll send you this idea, and we'll look forward to talking. Okay. Right. Yes, sir. Our next question. Hi, I'm Dr. Ravi Kulkarni from City University. This is a little technical question at the higher end. Uh, you mentioned the graduate school. Uh, I'm sure that uh, you're familiar with the problem about the graduate center appointments. These are the faculty lines having uh, lines only at the graduate school. Uh, there are some ethical dimension to this problem. I will not be able to get into in this uh, short time. But let me just ask you a basic general question that the City University has 100 such appointments having lifetime tenure at the Graduate Center without a formal connection to undergraduate or even master's level education. You'll recall that there is a public outcry that some senior faculty at Harvard, Princeton, Columbia, Yale, Cornell were not sufficiently interested or involved in undergraduate education. So even these places do not have such appointments without a formal connection to undergraduate education. So my question is, should a public institution like City University have so many such appointments? Well, uh, no, but the, it makes sense to have certain appointments. For example, Arthur, Arthur Schlesinger became a distinguished professor at the graduate school, and that was a, very much of a plus because it enhances the reputation of the school. The whole issue of uh, distinguished professors and the kind of appointments that you're talking about at the graduate center is one of the things that uh, Matt Goldstein will be reviewing because uh, as a chairman of the Board of Trustees, I would, in issues like that, or dealing with individual college presidents, I would rely upon the chancellor and I'll deal with the broader issues. So he's going to be looking into that. So I would like Thank to you. have a talk with right. you sometime. Thank you very much. Next question. My name is Bobby Gordon. And we've met before. Uh, my question involves actually with two or three foreign students who I helped in trying to improve their English do well. And they were taking courses, and I looked at some, I like to know how the test can be puffed because, and I believe that they're very diligent individuals. And very difficult, especially in the learning Russian to English because of the changing rules. It's not learning English to English, it's not learning Spanish to English, which are the grammars, are, it's quite similar. 
No, don't tell me that, because I, I couldn't speak English when I came here, no, and believe me, compared to Spanish, which is very phonetic, English is a very tough language no, English, to learn. But English is even a tougher language. What's your, Bob, what's your question, Bob? Yeah. My feeling is, after, question. after examining the papers that these people had in the test, I saw them, the, the, what they consider bad English is not that bad English. How do you, how do you uh, equalize or standardize what is good, what isn't good, and take into consideration the grammar difficulties of the languages involved? I mean, the, the fact is it's not being done today. Well, the, the, this is one of the things that the professors will have to do. I mean, uh, Dolores Fernandez, the president of Austos, has this problem because she gets nice. I was the one who was the founder of Austos Community College when I was president of the Bronx. She, we're getting a huge number of students coming in from uh, all parts of the world who don't speak English, and it takes time. But there is such a thing as good English. There are such things as sentences and paragraphs, and it's important that uh, they be... Uh, they, the students learn how to do that because, and they learn how to spell because spell check doesn't always work out. I can tell you. you know? uh, uh, yeah, so, so you know, we want people who are going to be able to go and get the very complicated jobs that exist in, uh, in the city, and that requires an ability to. Uh, be uh, absolutely fluent in the English language. But how so, are they going to stand Bob, up Bob, well, you know, thank you, there, Bob. Well, there is such a thing as a standard uh, basic English. Yes. Our next question. Yeah. Hi, my name is Joel Fontaine. I'm a graduate student at Baruch. And I was just curious as you were outlining your program, because I went to Berkeley undergrad, and one of the things that they did there is they had summer programs for students, and you know you provided with English class, a math class. And in terms of the design of the program, is there anything to provide allowances for, say, students who, who don't really need, I guess, a long-term remediation? But if you're talking about this was like a six-week summer class that I took, and after taking the six-week summer English course, I you know matriculated into Berkeley with no problem. So what allows? Well, well we have not just the summer courses, as I mentioned before. We can have courses during the uh, fall and spring semesters under continuing education. And we also have something which we call prelude to success, mm -hmm. where, for example, if you, if you want to go to Hunter College and you can't pass one of those tests, mm -hmm. but you come pretty close, mm -hmm. you can stay at Hunter College and technically register at Borough Manhattan Community College. So you'll be getting the courses, the remedial education at Hunter College, and once you pass that, you will then be automatically enrolled at Hunter College. So that way, uh, we uh, are able to meet the criteria of matriculating students who are ready for college work, but at the same time, expose them to the atmosphere of a senior college campus. I'm Norma Hart, trustee mm -hmm. of the City Club. Um, I have two p questions concerning the program of having CUNY faculty come into the high schools and provide college remediation now. there, college mm -hmm. level courses. Uh, first of all, would, what, who would bear the cost? Which system? CUNY? Or well, the, 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 uh, the, uh, the cost would be borne by the city and the state. It should not I be see. part of a our part budget. Of the education budget yeah. of either. It would be, in, it'd be or put or in the budget, but basically we are asking the mayor and the governor to provide for that cost. And in fact, they do provide for part of that cost now. The recent budget, I think the mayor approved something like $3 mil $3 million for college now for the existing programs. So we're not talking about a new program. Uh -huh. We're merely talking about expanding it into all of the high schools throughout the city. And the second part is, given that students are reaching high schools, needing remedial help if they're going to be ready for college, have you any thoughts on what should be done prior to high school within the city board? Oh yes, city? prior to the high school, as, as I mentioned, uh, I have been uh, opposed to social promotion. I think we should begin to evaluate the students in the first grade, I would not wait till the third grade, as Chancellor Crew is saying. Uh, you may remember that when I was deputy mayor, I was the one who set up educational gates, which where you, if students did their work, they pass, if not, they were left behind beginning in the first grade and got remedial assistance 
Unfortunately, after I left, and different chancellors and different mayors came into office, they quietly eliminated social promotion and we're back to it now. But I, I don't uh, limit myself only to uh, university courses or to high school courses. I want to go back to the uh, original source because uh, you may remember in the report that I prepared in 94, I showed um, a tremendous <coughs> amount of money being misappropriated to classes that made no sense. Uh, mayor Ed Koch, former Mayor Ed Koch, has an article in today's news where he complains about special education, which I complained about four years ago. I pointed out that special education was coming in at a cost of over $23,000 per student, which is more than it cost to send a kid to private school in Manhattan, and that no students were really getting out and that was being misused. We wrote the American with Disabilities Act in Congress in 1977. It was intended for students who have very serious problems, deaf, dumb, and other uh, disabilities, but not the kind of categories that a large percentage are covering now, categories such as uh, uh, language impaired, which would cover me because I have, according to any expert, a Spanish accent, so I would be sent off to special education. Um, emotionally disturbed, which covers all of us in this room. <laughs> because, <laughs> If we were not emotionally disturbed, we wouldn't be in New York City. But, but, but that's not what Congress intended. It meant, I mean, everybody's emotionally disturbed. But we meant serious disabilities. And that cost, even today, $2 billion. And that's because there was no way of sending some of the more problem children. And so this is why we really have to go back and review the entire system from first grade on. Thank you. Thank you. Next question. Jerry Spivak Interaction. I, I agree with you 100% about the free tuition. I That's went, all 100%? <laughs> I, went, I went to uh, that, yeah. uh, that type of okay. uh, well, yeah. Brooklyn College uh, for free. Uh, my, and then the Bill of Rights brought in pe people from my family. Mm -hmm. and, and Frank right. McCourt just spoke about how it right. transformed his mm -hmm. life. And I'm wondering whether we are limited, really, uh, by the previous uh, arrangement with the federal government that we must, in fact, uh, continue with uh, that agreement or not. No, no, we're not limited, but the first piece that I would like to work out is at least get, make sure they don't plan to increase tuition and that we, uh, we get the additional amounts of money that we require from the regular budgets. And obviously, as if we move into an area of budget surpluses, whether it's because of the tobacco settlements or whatever it may be, uh, we would like to get a piece of that too. And you could Thank you very free. much. Thank you yeah. very much. Next question, please. Ninety percent of New Yorkers don't know what CUNY is. What is CUNY? How many colleges? How many junior colleges? How many community colleges? And what's the total enrollment? Well, the, the CUNY is a combination of co community colleges and senior colleges, 11 senior colleges, six community colleges, one graduate school, one law school, uh, one biomedical school. It has about 200,000 students, but it also provides continuing education for approximately 150,000 students. To me, CUNY is more than that, however, more than just the pieces. CUNY is the uh, avenue of opportunity for people such as me who come here, who couldn't speak the language at all, and who had no resources whatsoever, I was able to move ahead because I got a tremendous education at uh, City College. And I majored in accounting, not because I'm fascinated with accounting, but because I needed to make a living the moment I graduated from college. Then I went to law school. But the fact that I graduated magna cum laude from Baruch at a time when you really had to be top student to do that meant that even though I had a very strong Spanish accent then, I would be accepted by any CPA firm in the world. So uh, it's, that is CUNY. That is what CUNY really is. CUNY is the future of New York. CUNY is the place where students go who cannot afford the top colleges. And that's why I want to improve. Thank you very much. Next question, please. Sandra Cologne, and I'm a student at Hostos Community College. And my question is that you acknowledge the importance of knowing more than one language to be competitive in the job market today. Um, well, would it, will CUNY invest the money in um, 
in having a dual language program as opposed to a monolingual because that would be more expensive. Well, uh, as you know, this is what we're doing at Astos. We are, uh, Astos was set up by me in 1968 as the first bilingual college in the state of New York because I recognize that young people would be coming in who needed to, who were fluent only in the uh, Spanish language and needed resources. Now we're providing, in effect, uh, uh, bilingual education in other colleges. But the point is, that, and as you may also know, I was the chief sponsor of the Bilingual and Bicultural Education Act of 1974 so that we could have bilingual education in the earlier grades. The problem that we have is that, unfortunately, the Board of Education is misusing that law, and it's threatening the whole theory and concept of bilingual education. Uh, Jim Traub wrote an article in the New York Times about three months ago in which he pointed out that he went to some uh, bilingual uh, schools in Brooklyn, elementary schools, and he found that students had been there for eight years and had not been able to learn the language. That is outrageous and inexcusable. I never would have been able to get it, uh, the bill through Congress unless there were two points. One is bilingual means two. It's not monolingual Spanish or monolingual any other language. And, and um, point number two is that it would be trans transitory in nature. can be uh, three years, five years, or eight years. So it is because the bilingual education program is being misused by educators that it's in danger of being wiped out. And I had a big struggle at Ostos to ensure that it would remain a bilingual college, which is what I had in mind when I approved it. Thank you very much. Next question. Um, my name is Kenya Williams, and I'm from Hostos Community College. And considering the flagship programs, will CUNY consider having flagship programs for the community colleges? Well, we certainly should. I mean, if you go back in the history, you may, uh, you may find that originally I wanted Ostos Community College to be a, a senior college. And if you know the area in the, uh, in the Bronx, I put Ostos at, in the Grand Concourse at 161st, next to Lincoln Hospital, the new Lincoln Hospital, which I had approved because Ostos was supposed to be specializing in health careers. And then when you get from 161st to 165th Street, there's a, a, an area of vacant land where I proposed having an educational park, which was one of the theories in those days, and schools have been built there. My idea was to have an elementary school junior high school, a high school, a community college, and a senior college, and I'm still working on it. Thank you. Next question. Yeah. And this is the famous Bill Hubbard, whose name was mentioned a little earlier. Um, uh, yeah. uh, my question concerns national politics and national funding. Um, the, if the private schools today in the city, at high school level, spend three times what the city spends, if you were going to bring the city level up to private school level, you'd have to spend an extra $10 billion, more or less, which is you know, a third of the city's entire budget. Uh, my question is, on the political horizon, the Republi leading Republican candidate, the two pillars of his platform are mili increased military expenditures and reduced taxes. And my concern is, we have uh, right now a possibility of surpluses in state, federal, city levels. Is that going to be eliminated if the Republicans come back into office? Uh, wh what is, are you concerned about that? Uh, no, it will not be eliminated. Uh, George Bush, as you know, has given a high priority to education in Texas, assuming he is the candidate. But the problem goes beyond George Bush or Gore or whoever are the candidates. The problem I found in Congress, because I served on the Committee on Education and Labor, is that Congress does not feel that funding education is a national responsibility. In other words, you get little pilot programs, little trinkets. The whole Title I has never really funded Head Start even, to the extent that it should. Title VII, which is bilingual education, has never been really funded. None of those programs have been funded, even though we had congressmen who were passionate advocates of additional aid, because every time we tried to get more money, uh, the word would come back from our colleagues from throughout the country that education is a local problem in many areas of even this state. 
in uh, Long Island and upstate, education is funded with uh, uh, school tax. And, and the tradition has been that the federal government, aside from funding new ideas, should not be provided, providing massive funds for education. It's a tradition that I regret, but that's the reality of what's going on. And, for example, if you notice, when candidates say they're going to provide for 100,000 teachers, this is what Gore said when he announced. And he said he's going to provide for 100,000 teachers, and he's going to uh, insist that Congress approve a budget of $10 billion. $10 billion is less than the budget of the Board of Education in New York City. I mean, it sounds good, but 100,000 teachers isn't going to solve our problem. We have 75,000 teachers in New York City. The massive kind of funding that is required to improve the educational system I can tell you, if I was the President of the United States, I couldn't get it through Congress because, because the attitude is that it's a state and local responsibility. And even in the local area, primarily the school tax, the local school boards are the ones who raise money for schools. So that's the reality, and it's, it's misleading, in fact, when presidential candidates and senatorial candidates uh, have press conferences to announce that they're going to fund educational programs. I know, having served in Congress, there's no likelihood that that individual is going to do anything of the sort because the votes simply are not there. Okay? Thank you very much. Next question. Thank you. Herman, your comment on building the West Side Urban Renewal Area, which you know I followed slavishly, uh, with a zero budget, that kind of creativity can be applied also uh, to the school, to tuition and things like that. I teach in the Graduate School of Urban Studies, Queens College. Many of my students, it costs them zero. They're all union members. And we check when, we, when they come in, their union has an education fund. And if they pass the course, they pay their tuition. They even pay for remediation and books. I don't know who's looking into this kind of thing, but I really do wish somebody would do that with your kind of creativity. Can you find somebody who can oh, yes. help us do that? Yeah, I mean, obviously, in the short time that I have, I can't go into all the programs that we're talking about. But uh, apropos what you were discussing, this morning I had breakfast with Matt Goldstein, and we were talking about setting up a group of uh, really top business people who will be working with the city university because all the other institutions have him. Um, Matt, John Bradimus, who sat next to me in Congress, became the president of NYU, and Bradimus would tell me that he would raise a million dollars a week for NYU, each and every week during the time he was president. And in the private universities, getting the support of distinguished uh, alumni, uh, hundreds of millions of dollars are raised, which are used to help uh, to pay for tuition. Now, we have some of the most distinguished alumni in the, in the world. I mean, in the, the City College graduates in my generation, we have more top CEOs than Columbia, Yale, uh, or Harvard. And uh, they're all they're around. You know, they are CEOs of major corporations. That's the kind of group I'm trying to bring together to do what you said. You've been watching the City Club of New York's Public Policy Forum. Our guest, Herman Badillo, Chairman of the City University's Board of Trustees. Thank you very much. Thank you.